Throughout the Old Testament, there are several moments where there is a, a call to holiness. And we're going to be looking at that uh, tonight, uh, kind of an un, in an unlikely place with an unlikely character. But uh, we're going to start by looking at uh, this concept of bearing it under the oak. And what Jacob did in that place, you might have the technical term in your version, a terebinth tree, which really isn't fancy, it's a scrub oak. Uh, if you've seen scrub oak, not unlike what we have in the parking lot, uh, you've seen a terebinth tree. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at that, and, and, but starting off by looking at some circumstances in Jacob's life that led up to this moment. It's important for us to see what leads up to what's happening there in chapter 35. And Jacob's life wasn't normal. Um, being a, a surplanter, there were a lot of things that happened in his life that kind of read or read like a, a telenovela or read like a, what do you call it, soap opera. There it is. Uh, and so when you read these things, it's rather interesting what happens. And one of the first things that we read about in his life uh, is this birthright situation between he and his brother in Genesis chapter 25. He takes advantage of his brother. Brother's coming in, and we, we see the brother coming in from hunting, and he is about to die of, uh, in, his, in all rights, in all respects. Uh, he wanted to eat. Um, and in verse 30 of chapter 25, uh, we see, uh, and Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am a famished, therefore his name was called Edom. And this is the New American Standard, it really puts it in plain English there for us, that he comes in and wants something to eat. He's famished. How many of you have been famished? How many? It's hard to believe that also, like, we've been famished for very long, right? We, we normally don't go long uh, without eating. Uh, but Jacob, being the surplanter, takes an opportunity here, and he says, well, first sell me your birthright. Now, how many of you would have thought of that? I probably would have thrown a bowl of food at him, right? Here's some ramen noodles. I, just, I would have just thrown food at him. I would not have thought, you know, here's, a, here's something where I can just get his birthright from him. And, and it may not be that Esau necessarily took it that seriously, um, but Esau, in Esau's mind, he was literally on death's door because he needed to eat. He said, behold, I'm about to die, so what use of the birthright is that to me? And, and Jacob says in verse 33, essentially translated, pinky swear first, and uh, swear it to me. Uh, and so he swears it. But the Bible says, thus Esau despised his birthright. He despised his birthright. The comparison of his birthright being firstborn he sold it for a bowl of red stuff uh, that he might not die in his eyes. And so he takes that advantage of that situation, and that plays out later on. In Genesis chapter 27, uh, another situation arises. Now, we know the Bible tells us that Rebekah loved Jacob, uh, and Isaac loved Esau. Uh, and so uh, that really makes her a great family dynamic, right? a lot of harmony in the family when that takes place. Uh, and so in chapter 27, uh, we hear uh, Rebecca overhears sort of like something going on in, in verse 4 where Isaac says, prepare a savory dish for me such as I love and bring it to me and I may eat so that I, my soul may bless you before I die. Uh, so Isaac and his son Esau both have an affinity uh, for food and he wants this special dish before he blesses him. And so Rebecca hears this, right? She's in the tent over, right? Tent walls are very thin. Uh, and so she hears what's going on, and she makes sure that her son, her favorite, gets this birthright. Now, what's the problem? Are Jacob and Esau 100% equal? Are they identical twins? They are not. Uh, they are not identical twins. One is more, more rough around the edges and, and hairy, uh, and the other one is not. And so when Rebecca says, hey, you're going to take, I'm going to cook the food because I know what your dad likes, and you're going to take your brother's place. And Jacob's first thing he said was, well, I'm not that hairy. I don't have it. And he says, well, they, they use lamb or uh, goat's wool and put goat skin on them. And in verse 18, Jacob goes to his father and he came to his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am, who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. 
Uh, I have done as you told me. Uh, Here is your food, right? In verse 19. Isaac said, how is it you have come back so quickly? Uh, And so he asks these questions, and Isaac answers them, or uh, 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 Jacob answers them. Verse 22, he says, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He felt the the goat hair. Uh, And so he asks him again, are you really my son? Verse 24, are you really him? And he says, sure, that's me. I'm, I'm your son. And so he gives him this blessing. And as soon as the blessing is given to him, verse 30 tells us that as soon Jacob had hardly gone out of the tent, when Esau comes, you know, bounding in with the food, and the gig is up, right? He understood what happened. And Isaac said, well, who was that man that I blessed, right? Look in verse 35. And he said, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. 36. He said, is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, he has taken away now my blessing. Now, is... Is Esau being 100% honest here? Did Jacob really take away his, his, his birthright, or did he sell it? He kind of sold it, didn't he? He's not being 100% honest with the information, and he did trick him out of the blessing, uh, but here's what's happening. Uh, now Esau is really angry, verse 41. So Esau before, bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing which he had taken from his father, had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. And apparently he said this out loud while wringing his hands in an evil laugh because somebody heard it and then told the mother. And so mother says, you need to leave. Your brother wants to kill you. Plus, I don't like the ladies around here. I don't want you marrying with these ladies. So go back to the homeland and Mary from, from the household of Laban, uh, Isaac sends him off in chapter 28 uh, and, and, and gives him that blessing. But what's interesting in chapter 28 is that Isaac get, talks to him about the blessing that God had given him. Beginning of verse 3, he said, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply, and you're, be, you become many peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham, and to you and to your descendants, and with you. And so he hopes that God would give him that blessing uh, in his journey. Uh, And so he is sent off, and Jacob goes. What happens in his travels? He's leaving, he's going over to his native lands, and he spends the night out uh, in, in his travels, and he has a vision. And he sees these things, uh, uh, take place, angels descending and ascending, and in verse 13 uh, of chapter 28, he says, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in all your families, descendants shall of all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Now, here is God's promise. He reaffirms with Jacob the promise that Abraham received in Genesis chapter 12. He reaffirms that promise. And when Jacob wakes up from this dream, does he just kind of shrug it off? Just say, no, another, another, another crazy dream? Obviously not. In verse 16, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, uh, and this is the gate of heaven. And so the impression that Jacob got from that place is so strong, he renames this place. It was loose, and he renames it Bethel, or house of God, and renames that place. And he makes sort of a deal with God uh, in verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey, that I take and will give me food to eat and garment to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. And so he makes this sort of deal. God already said those things are going to happen, but he makes that deal with him, and he sets up the stone which he used as a pillow that night, as as sort of a pillar uh, for, uh, which makes you wonder about their their bedding situation back in those times. But he sets that up as a, as a pillar of memory for what happened there in that place. This is important. 
star this, note this. We're going to be coming back to this in just a moment as to why we go back to Bethel. Now, when he goes into Laban's territory and goes to Laban, and uh, he comes to Laban, he comes to Laban empty-handed. The only commodity that Jacob had was time, right? And so he goes there looking for a wife, and he sees, who does he see when he gets there? We have two daughters. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and faith. Uh, he was smitten, uh, is what we would say. Uh, and so Jacob served seven years. Uh, he said, I don't have anything, essentially. And so he had time. And so he said, I'll serve seven years for Rachel. And he served those seven years. Uh, and we have a hallmark kind of stamp here in verse 20. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. And everyone said, ah, oh, right? Uh, and so he serves seven years. The wedding day comes. He's probably rather anxious, right? He wakes up next to sad eyes, right? He wakes up to the wrong woman, which makes you wonder about their marriage customs. Um, uh, but anyway, he wakes up next to the wrong woman, and he goes out in verse 25, so it came about in the morning, and behold, it was Leah. And he says, what have you done to me, to Laban, right? What kind of father-in-law? Which is interesting that, that Jacob, the trickster, the supplanter, would get a trickster supplanter father-in-law, right? Uh, and so uh, he said, what have you done to me? And so he serves another seven years. And that's the time, that's the commodity he has uh, for, uh, for Rachel. Uh, and so during that time, it was back and, back and forth. Uh, with uh, rearing sons, uh, and it was back and forth with relationship with Laban to the point that Laban had been blessed, and Jacob said, let us go, we, we're going to go somewhere else, we're going to move on, and Laban says, no, I don't want you to move on because I'm blessed because you're here, God is blessing you, and in turn blessing me because I'm blessing you, why would I let you leave, I don't want you to leave, and so they eventually leave in secret because, verse 2 of chapter 31 uh, we see that Jacob saw the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly to him as formerly. And so he begins, he needs to move. God says, return uh, to your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Uh, and so uh, another, another dream. Uh, and in verse 13, God says to him in verse, chapter 31, verse 13, I am the God of Bethel, where you, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me, now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. As they're leaving, Laban eventually, after they've left three days, Laban eventually finds out that they've left and catches up with them. He says, you weren't supposed to leave. You left too late. You're supposed to warn me that you're leaving. We were going to have this party about you leaving, that kind of stuff, which is nice to say after the fact, right? Um, but when they left, Rachel took the house gods of her father and snuck those, hid those away. And uh, Laban comes in looking for these house gods. He's turning everything upside down. And Rachel ends up hiding them. Um, but uh, this covenant is made. And that note, those, those, those house gods, we're going to come back to those in just a moment. Uh, but uh, Jacob berates. Uh, Laban for making these accusations, and they make a covenant of peace, and they leave. Um, God has been with Jacob this whole time, has he not? He goes into a land, his only commodity is time, and now he's wealthy. Wealthy beyond what he could have imagined when he first got there. Uh, but the one thing that he doesn't know about is his brother Esau. He's been commanded to go back to the land, the, the, the land of his youth, to go back to where his father is, but he doesn't know about Esau. And so he, he's traveling on, and he hears word that Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men. Now, when you left, right, Jacob left, they were not on good terms when Jacob left. Uh, and so now you hear that your brother Esau is coming with 400 men. What is your assumption? This is not going to be good, right? This is not good. And so he puts this kind of... Uh, set up in front as buffer between he and his family uh, and sets his people out in different stages to kind of create this buffer between he and his family. Um, but he goes out in front 
But between, since then, or before, the night before he meets his brother, he wrestles with, with God in chapter 32. In verse 28, God says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. And so now his name is changed, for he'll be a father uh, because he has striven with God and prevailed. And so that, that name changes. And so in chapter 33, the day comes where he meets Esau. And it is not what Jacob thought was going to happen. In chapter 33, Esau was coming and 400 men with him. Uh, and so he divided his children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids, and he put maids in the children, and so he's creating this buffer. And then verse 4, he goes out, and verse 3 goes out ahead. And then verse 4, then Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. Was that what he was expecting? Probably not. It's reconciliation. It's two brothers, they have not seen each other for years, left on poor terms, are reconciled. And he tries to offer him a gift over and over again, and eventually um, Esau takes it, but uh, they're reconciled. God has done everything that Jacob asked. Everything that Jacob asked has come to pass. So now... We go to chapter 35. Now we go to chapter 35. Having that background, then God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel. Here is the call to Bethel. Live there. Make an altar there to, to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. God is calling him to Bethel. The last time he was in Bethel, he had that vision, and it was a, the awesomeness of God was impressed upon him. God had called him, had given him a charge. I will be with you. I will bless you. And in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He had given him that charge. And so he asked the people to purify themselves, to wash their garments, put away your foreign gods. Uh, you know, wink, wink, Rachel, right? So put away these things from among you. Purify yourself, change your garments, and arise and go to Bethel. Uh, he talks about God in verse 3, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I've gone. That's the God that Jacob knew. Jacob had experienced that throughout his life. It had been a rocky life, partly because of him, but God had been with him the whole time. God had been with him. So they gave Jacob their foreign gods, which they, uh, the rings that the, which were in their ears, those things that might mark uh, uh, allegiance to a foreign deity, and Jacob hid them under the oak or the, or the terebinth tree, which was near Shechem. And so there was this purity, the putting away of these things and going to be in the presence of God. Bury the impurity under the oak. Well, I want us to think about this in relationship to our lives in a call to holiness. Has God called us to be holy as Christians? And the answer is indeed yes. God has called us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, God has indeed called us. He says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a call to action. This is a call to action. Prepare your minds. Keep sober in spirit. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. Sounds and reads a lot like do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, right? Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. But like the Holy One who called you, be yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So God uses this language from Leviticus chapter 11 and says, you need to be holy. I've done everything for you to be a holy people. And God has called us to be holy. When we look at that word, we think, I could never be holy. I, don't, I, can't, I can't be holy. I make mistakes. And you are correct. You by yourself cannot be holy. Man has never been able to be holy by himself. It is only because of God that we can be sanctified, that we can be holy. Much like Jacob, Jacob could not have done the things that he did by himself. It was only because of God that he was prosperous 
because of the blessings that were upon him. And likewise, because of the blessing of grace, we can be holy if we will be obedient, if we will keep sober and prepare our minds to do that. So we are called to be holy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 16, or chapter 6, there is this call to come out from among them and be different. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Beginning in verse, verse 14. And this is one of those passages where they should have moved the chapter one more verse. Right? They didn't really, they missed the mark, but uh, we'll let it slide. But beginning in verse 14, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawfulness or fellowship light with darkness? This concept here, uh, do not be bound together. Uh, you might have in your translation, do not be unequally yoked. And that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10, where they were commanded not to plow with an oxen and a donkey yoked together. Could you imagine that? Here's a donkey and an oxen plowing together. Which way do you think they're going to go? In circles. They're going to go any way the ox wants to go. Does that donkey have any say in their relationship? No. Right? And this, this you know, can be used... Uh, very much in, in marriage relationships. It's very important who we choose to marry. Right, guys? Wink, wink, right? Yeah, nod your head. Yes, nod your head. Okay. Uh, it's important who we choose to marry. Because if you're unequally yoked, one of you is going to be the ox and one of you is going to be the donkey. So let that sink in for a second. Maybe it changes from day to day. Uh, but one of you is going to be the ox and one of you is going to be the donkey. Do not be unequally yoked. What fellowship, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, light with darkness, or harmony, Christ with Belial, or what is the believer in common with the unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are to be the temple of the living God, just as God has said. And I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. God called his people to be holy. When you read through the Old Testament and you get into the laws and the thou shalt nots and thou shalt do these things and all these strange purification rituals and things, it was so that God could walk among his people. The reason he had them do all these things is so he could stomach to be among them. You've got to do this for me to walk among you. God has called us to be holy, to be different. If you're living your life and you feel out of step with the world around you, good job. You should. If you're living your life and you don't feel out of step and you feel just like everybody else, you might want to reevaluate. Because God has called us to be different. Are we going to be noticed? Yes. Are we going to be noticed if we're striving to be holy? Yes, we are. But we have to decide which is more important. Do I want to be noticed by God and have his approval? Or do I want to be noticed by men and have men's approval? We must come out and be holy. And that's really what Jacob was calling them to do when he asked them to purify themselves, change their clothes, get away from these things, come out from among them. Therefore, come out from among them, verse, their midst, verse 17, and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, chapter 7, verse 1, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. If this is the promise that God says he will be to me a father, that he will be to me somebody who welcomes me and I will be to him a son or daughter. If that's God's promise, why wouldn't I come out from among these things? Jacob said, God took care of me. And we're going back to Bethel where I saw him. We're going back there. Let's put away these things. Let's bury the old man, like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 talks about this concept of burying the old man and getting away from those things. And uh, this imagery is very helpful. Uh, in verse 20, he says, But you did not learn Christ in this way, if 
indeed you have heard him and you've been taught by him just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. Is it possible that we've laid aside the old self that picked things up again? There was, um, it was in fifth grade, I got to go hunting uh, with my dad on the weekend with his hunting buddies. It was quite a big deal to go hunting with dad. Uh, this was up in the mountains in Idaho. And uh, I learned two things about my father. Um, he did like a John Wick move off the back of a four-wheeler and shot a deer one time. And I was like, let's not ever make this man really mad, right? Um, but the other thing, I really like picking up rocks, shiny rocks, like crystallized rocks, stuff like that. I'm sharing too much, maybe. And so I'm picking up these rocks as we're hunting to the point that my pockets are probably like jingling, which is not helpful when you're trying to be silent. My dad turns to me, and I still remember, we're, we're standing like just on the edge of the woods and there's like kind of a, a ravine down beside us and I had just picked up the shiniest one. It was quartz crystal, I was very happy. And my dad turns to me and son, you've got to decide, he says, if you're hunting or picking up rocks. And I was like, okay. So I threw them all out, except for that one. I kept the one. But there are times in life when we got to ask ourselves, are we living the Christian life or are we picking up rocks? Are there things we're picking up that we shouldn't be picking up? It's shiny. It looks awesome. But the bigger prize I'm still working for. The thing I'm here for is still out there, but there's this shiny thing that I'm picking up. And likewise here, we need to make sure we're continue to lay aside that old man in verse 22. Lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you have been be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Everything starts in your mind and put on the new self which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. There's that holiness again, righteousness, based in truth. And we see these things. We understand this concept, right? We understand what it is. All right, I, I need to make sure I put those things away and continue to put those things away and strive for what lays ahead of me. But every day we wake up and there's another shiny rock. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. And you know what yours is, right? We don't have to go into a list of possible temptations. You know what it is. You know what the most difficult thing in your life to put down is. And you're thinking about it right now. Put it away. Bury it under the oak. And lastly, let's look at Romans chapter 6. If you haven't buried yourself, then it might be time to make a change. Because until you've buried yourself, you can't be holy. According to this passage, Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Over and over again, this concept of, of the similarity between Christ's death and baptism, that we are in verse 4, buried with him through baptism. So that as Christ was raised, we might raise. So when do I get to walk in newness of life? After I'm raised. A new life starts after baptism. So we become united with him in verse 5. In verse 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, done with, away with forever. I can be holy because of that burial. I can be holy because of that sacrifice. Verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, and we believe he shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die, death no longer is master over him. Which is interesting, if you look in chapter 5, there's those things that reign over us, that reign over us. One of those was death. Death has reigned over us 
until Christ. Until Christ, death was our champion. We couldn't defeat death. But after Christ, and after we're buried with him in baptism, we're now victors over what had victory over us. Victory over sin, victory over death. And so verse 11 says, Even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God. Do not let sin reign. It had reign in our body. Don't let it reign anymore. Don't let it have control. Verse 13, Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. So we have to make a decision. Are we truly dead to ourselves? Or are we letting sin reign in our bodies again? Are we picking those things up? We have to make a decision. And I'd like you to make a decision tonight. Would you decide tonight to walk in holiness? Would you decide tonight to walk in holiness? I, you know that shiny rock that's there in your pocket? You know it's there. It's been hard to let go. But maybe tonight's the night. I'm, I've decided that I'm letting that go. And I'm going to serve Christ. I'm going to have victory over death that has reigned in my life. Victory over sin because of him. Maybe you need to put aside negative influences in your life. I have not been the influence I should have been. I've not been the ox in the relationship. I've been the other guy. Maybe it's time to step up or put away those influences in your life. Whatever it is that you've been gathering, I would encourage you to, to bury it under the oak tonight. And if you need to make that decision to put Christ on a baptism, I would encourage you to bury yourself tonight and come to him as we stand and as we sing.